Hello, everybody, and I'd like to welcome you to our latest Outbreak Management Advisory Board. Um, just to thank all of those that are here today and those watching along um, at home as well. And before we go any further, I'd just like to, to make a record um, of any apologies uh, that we've had, uh, and then I'll do a couple of welcomes um, after uh, that. Um, so if we could go through the apologies, Tracy, that would be appreciated. Thank you, Chair. So we have apologies from Sally Tyra at the local medical council. Apologies from Mike Padgham and Beverly Proctor at the independent care group and John Pattinson is here to substitute. Apologies from Anne Coyle and Ian Floyd at the council. Apologies from Charlie Jeffrey um, from the university and Ian Wiggins is substituting and apologies from Sean Balsam at Health Watch York. Thank you very much. So just to welcome Ian um, from the university and also John from the ICG to their first meetings of the of the groups. Appreciated you you both coming along today. Um, that takes us straight on to um, the first agenda item, which is declarations of interest. So I'll give a couple of seconds uh, in case anybody wishes to, to raise an electronic at hand to, to register uh, any particular declarations. Um, if there are none, we'll go swiftly on to agenda item two, which is the minutes of our last meeting. That was on the 29th um, of September. There were a couple of um, actions um, that I'll do first before we sign off uh, the minutes. Um, there was some uh, clarity that was requested around advice uh, for school age uh, ch children, which has been acted upon and done. Um, and there was also a, a, an action to provide a, a behavioural insight report um, at a future meeting. And I think that Fiona is going to give us a quick update on that point. Um, yeah, so it wasn't, um, that's the comms issue, so I can't update on the behavioural insights, but there's, there was a second part of that action, which was around the conversation we'd had about uptake of vaccines in the 18 to 29 age group. So I've got an a update for the group on that part of it, if that's okay. Um, so I think the question was last time, um, if we think that there's a high uptake in the 18 to 29s who are university students, does that mean that when we look overall at the 18 to 29 uh, vaccine uptake that we're actually masking that there might be low uptake in, in this sort of non-university population in, in that age group. Um, so we went away to have a little look at that and so thank you to um, the University of York who shared some of their data that they've been collecting around vaccine uptake and also for colleagues in the BI hub who, who then compared that and uh, with the sort of general vaccine uptake. So um, it's kind of old data now because we did this quite soon after the last meeting so it was kind of beginning of October but at that point when we looked at it and we were looking particularly at first dose of vaccine because um, quite a lot in that age group wouldn't have had the chance to have had the second dose but looking at some of that and there's a few caveats around the data some of it was kind of estimated but essentially the answer that we got to was that it's likely that in the general population the uptake of first dose of vaccine is 30% lower than the university population. So um, it, it is likely that having come to university um, and being a university student is a prompt and, and, and they have higher uptake than the general population. Uh, and also because we know the work that um, Nimbus has been doing in terms of putting on vaccine drop-ins uh, on campus has probably had a, an impact as well and has, has made it easier for, for that part of the population to, to get a vaccine. So um, I, I think that there probably is a lower uptake in, in the general population in that 18 to 29 uh, younger group so it may be that we do need to do something to look at how how we make that offer kind of more accessible um, and the sort of messaging that we get out to those people in that age range who aren't part of the university um, population. Thank you very much uh, for that Fiona and you're, you're right that second action that I mentioned was with at Gareth and, and comms. Uh, so I should uh, welcome Eddie as well. And I know you've got a comms agenda item later. So we'll either pick that up then, unless, unless you want to add anything now. 
No, I'm happy to cover it during the report. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. So that then, um, just want to check that everybody's happy um, to sign off the minutes as, as a correct record. Um, again, I'm seeing a few nods, but now's, now's the time to raise your hand if you're not happy. Um, so thank you for those nods. So we'll sign off the, the minutes of the last meeting. And um, that then takes us straight through to agenda item three, um, which is the regular item we receive about the, the current situation um, in York. And the presentation um, that Fiona is about to give will be published um, after the meeting uh, with the minutes. So a copy of that will, will go up, uh, Fiona. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I think, as usual, we'll share some slides so that you can see uh, what the data looks like. So if we go on to the first slide, uh, you can see there the usual um, graph in terms of what the case rates look like and also on the left where we sit in terms of our neighbours in the Yorkshire and Humber region. So our rate of cases at the moment are, stands at 445.9 per 100,000. Um, so it's you know just under 1,000 cases in a week across York residents. Uh, and that is a higher rate than the regional and national averages. Um, so what you can see on that graph on the right is we've seen a steady rise in the rate of cases really since uh, around September time. You can see that it did start to drop off a bit, but it's now on the increase again. And we think that that drop in cases uh, was related to uh, the break in, in schools over, over the half term at the end of October. And if you go on to the next slide, you'll see why I say that I think it that was the reason for that drop. So as you can see from this, the majority of cases that we are having at the moment are in the 10 to 14 age range and the 5 to 9 age ranges. So that's really what's um, driving a lot of the rates um, at the moment. And then the next biggest um, group is the 40 to 44, which um, many of those will be parents of those children. So we're seeing quite a lot of household transmission um, at, the, at the moment as well. Um, so the other bit that we uh, monitor on the next slide is our um, rates in the over 60 um, population. So fortunately, um, you, what you can see is this has started to drop. So we did see a bit of an increase at the same time as general rates went up, but in most recent weeks, that has started to fall. Um, so that rate currently stands at 136.2 per 100,000. Um, and that drop is likely to be um, as a result of the um, booster vaccination program. So those kind of 60 plus groups now eligible for their third um, dose in the booster. So that is that is having um, an impact. So just to go back then and, and think about the, what we're seeing in the school um, and younger populations. So this kind of shows what's been happening since the start of term. So you can see along the bottom there, the gray line, that's what we're seeing in the 18 to 21 kind of university age um, group within the city. And that's a very different picture to what we saw last year when, when students returned to universities. Um, and, and that is a, the impact of the vaccine. So we're seeing really low rates um, in the university age. But what we have seen and saw really at the start of September was that increase, um, particularly in secondary schools. So that's the orange line and um, started to see that go up. And then we had a, a really steep climb, you know, within sort of two to three weeks of schools going back um, in that age group. As I say, it did start to drop off um, around the half term. Uh, it started to increase again a little bit in that 10 to 14 age group. Uh, and what we're starting to see now is the primary school children. It's been a much more gradual sort of increase in that age range. Um, but now we're actually sort of starting to see in, in the most recent days that the numbers in the primary school children is, is kind of starting to overtake uh, the secondary school children. And um, it's 
probably too early to see in the data yet the impact of um, the vaccination programme in the 12 to 15 year olds playing out in the data. I'm sure um, colleagues will talk about the vaccination um, uptake rates a bit later. So, so we know that that programme is, is sort of still active and rolling out and, and we'll hope to kind of see that impact but probably not for, for a few more weeks yet. Um, so if we look at the um, next slide, this just gives a bit of an overview in terms of where it is in the city, uh, which wards we're, we're seeing cases in, uh, and which wards particularly we're kind of seeing that increase um, in cases. Um, so quite a few wards there where, where the numbers have been going up. Uh, and I uh, have to say that some of those wards uh, increases are particularly linked to where we know that there are schools who have had um, a lot of cases. But I think also, you know, it's worth pointing out that, you know, every ward across York uh, has got cases. And um, so the, that kind of community transmission um, is high at the moment. Just going on to um, the next slide then, I haven't sort of shown positivity rates for a while because they, they had dropped quite low, but um, really they, they have been going up. So if people remember the pillar one tests are the tests that are done at the hospital. Uh, pillar two is where um, you know most of us would go. So Popperton Bar or, or the walk-in centre at Wentworth Way. So that, that's the pillar two tests. Um, and the latest uh, positivity rate stands at 13.5%. Uh, so we generally talk about wanting the positivity rate to be lower than 5%. And um, so we're, you know, quite away from that. And it has been on on the increase in, in recent weeks. So um, really something that, you know, we need to make sure that we've got as many people testing so that we're finding um, those cases um, and taking the appropriate public health action on those. Uh, on to the next slide. Um, so looking at what's happening in York Hospital. So as the cases started to rise in September, we did start to see an increase in um, hospital admissions. But as you can see, when you can compare it to where we had other peaks in infection and hospital admissions, it wasn't that same steep increase that we had before. So it was a much slower um, increase. And actually it looks like those uh, are on the decline um, now. So at the most recent period at the end of last week, um, 45 people um, in general and acute beds and two in ITU. And probably, although the cases are still going up, that drop in hospital admissions will be related to the fact that actually our rate in the 60 plus group um, is dropping. So we're not seeing as many in hospital now. And then just to look on the next slide um, at what we're seeing um, in terms of deaths across the city. Uh, so if we can just look at that next slide. Um, so we, we do still have um, some people who are dying with COVID, uh, but very low numbers uh, across the city. That's the red line across the bottom. And then we look at all deaths uh, in the city compared to our kind of baseline um, years of 2015 to 19, which is the orange. So as you can see, um, when we had peaks of COVID deaths, uh, all deaths uh, went above what we'd normally expect to see. Uh, at the moment, um, we're tracking quite closely with, with what we would normally expect to see um, at this time of year. So um, just want to talk then finally about test and trace. Um, so I think I've said before that um, the offer around who can get access to lateral flow tests has changed quite significantly. There's much easier access. So either you can collect them from pharmacies or you can collect 
them from our testing sites to do those at home. And we know that lots of people are doing that regular testing. So this is just a, a visual in terms of the number of people who come each week to have a, a, what we call an assisted test at one of our council run sites. So whilst the number has dropped off um, quite a lot because people are doing that testing at home so it's kind of not in the thousands anymore but there's still a few hundred every week who who still need that service from the council to have that assisted test because they're unable to to do it at home so you know that's still an important service that we provide to um, a part of our population and then on to the next slide, um, it just shows you in terms of all the lateral flow testing across whether it's people coming to our sites or whether it's people doing it at home or people doing it at, as part of a work-based programme. Actually, we've had quite an increase in the number of people doing lateral flow tests. Um, and obviously the thing to point out here is this is based on the people who go on to the government portal and report the lateral flow tests. So we're probably quite aware that there are, are people who take lateral flow tests and don't report the results as long as they follow the advice depending on the result, you know, in some respects. And I guess that doesn't matter. But, um, you know, we can see that there are a, a number of people um, doing that regular testing, which obviously helps to find cases. And then, you know, those people can take that uh, necessary public health action uh, and then just coming on to then where our offer is so as I said so we still have three sites um, where we do that assisted testing so at both of the universities and then at Foxwood we have a number of community venues where people can come and collect uh, test kits if they want to do um, testing at home uh, and then we also have a programme of outreach work. So uh, we do door to door um, uh, offering of, of tests and we get really good reception. Um, when we do that, we also hand out information about where uh, vaccination clinics are when we're doing that door to door. We can answer questions if people have got worries about the vaccination or or just general kind of COVID questions. Um, so you can see there the areas that we've been in throughout October and November and, and what our plan is for, for November and December. Um, and you can see there, we, we can tailor that as well. So um, we were aware that we had a high number of cases in the Dunnington area. So we were able to kind of divert that outreach work and actually send the team into Dunnington uh, where we felt that, you know, they maybe needed uh, access to more testing and, and some support in that area. So it can be quite a reactive offer as well. And then just going on to the last slide. So this is um, the um, performance of our local contact tracing service. So our local team uh, will follow up all positive COVID cases in order to carry out the contact tracing with them. And um, we stand consistently at over 90% of positive cases are successfully contact um, and traced uh, and the tracing done with that team um, and the orange bars there show show the number of people so when we try to call people if we can't contact them after three calls we will uh, do a home visit and um, very few have to do a home visit for now so and um, kind of demonstrates where we were earlier in the year where um, the, the calls were initially done from um, the national team. Once that's kind of moved over to a call from a local number and a local service, we've had much better uh, engagement with that. So we don't, you know, less than 5% of those cases need a home visit. And so that's, that's the end of my slides. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, uh, Fiona. And obviously I'll open it now for questions uh, or comments. Um, one, one from me first, I've seen quite a lot of coverage, including in the local government chronicle, um, particularly about um, the test and trace services being uh, wound uh, down at a national level uh, and responsibility um, passed to, to local authorities. Although I'm 
thinking that's good news on the one hand in terms of that last slide that you just showed us and the impact that the local service can have uh, as opposed to the national service my concern is does that come with any money or support or local authorities just expected to to pick up all of that work so i don't know if you could tell us any more or sharon might want to come in and is there anything this uh, board might want to 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 do or say about that yeah, so can probably uh, report back to you that the so in terms of contact tracing, the national um, test uh, contact tracing service are cutting the number of call handlers from about nine thousand down to about five and a half thousand. Some of that is due to the fact that they've streamlined their processes in various ways. The other part of that is that um, potentially from um, next month, they, if you're a contact of a, a person who's tested positive, that you will no longer get a phone call from National Test and Trace. You will um, just get either an email or a text to tell you that you've been a contact and, and what you need to do. So, you know, a, quite a shift uh, in terms of how those contacts of cases will be followed up. And um, in terms of any additional funds um, that are going to come to local authority to do the contact tracing, nothing that I'm aware of. In terms of our um, contact tracing service, we um, pay those staff out of the uh, COVID outbreak ma management fund that was received. And I understand that that won't be repeated after March next year. In terms of the work that we do around testing, we get our costs covered on a monthly basis. So um, in terms of what we spend each month, we submit a return to the Department of Health and Social Care and those costs um, get reimbursed. Um, but again, we don't, you know, there, there will be a programme next year of winding down and um, testing. Um, so we know that we'll be doing this work probably until the end of March next year, but then, you know, testing will start to, to get wound down and that will be the same with PCR testing as well. There are plans for how some of those regional test sites will um, start to wind down as well. So we'll, we'll find out more about that um, next year. Thanks, Fiona. Sharon? I can just come in and just add to that. Um, I guess the risk that um, the board needs to be aware of is that um, we, we we don't really know how much money we're going to get for um, our testing beyond the end of December. So um, we're, we're kind of being paid retrospectively, if you like. Um, and um, Fiona, I think I'm right in saying, and, and unless you've been to a meeting and, and, and heard something more recently this week, that at the moment we still don't know what our funding arrangements are going to be for testing um, beyond the 31st of December. The risk associated with that, of course, is that we have staff employed uh, to do testing and we have various contracts in, in, in place. Um, and uh, we need uh, sufficient notice, probably at least three months notice um, of changes to those funding arrangements to be able to wind down our local testing offer. So that, that's the, the, the risk that we're managing in York in common with every other uh, local authority um, requesting um, kind of some assurances really from the Department of Health and Social Care of their intentions around funding um, beyond the end of December. And, and Sharon, and just on that local trace system then, presumably sim similar concerns into next year? So for the contact tracing, as Fiona's described, um, we have the COVID outbreak management fund um, that we so we've received that money already. It's 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 already in the system. So um, we um, have that money until the end of March. 
what we've been able to do working with the council's finance department is um, ring fence three months worth of funding with the contact tracing team. So we've got um, uh, that, that's how we've mitigated against that risk. We, we know we have three months worth of, of funding. So we're not in such, um, the, the risk around contact tracing is not as significant as the risk to testing. Um, but clearly, um, you know, we, we don't know what's going to happen after, uh, after March, as Fiona has indicated. We know that the government will be changing the testing offer and we'll probably start to wind down some of the testing but we don't yet know what that's going to look like so we're managing an element of, of risk there but we have mitigations in in place to be able to manage that as as, as best we can thank you mike thanks chair and thanks for that fiona i think that was a very comprehensive set of data. My question really is about the hospitalisation data that you presented showing um, that the, the, the peak of hospitalisation this time has been lower than when we were in previous peaks of COVID. Um, across the national media over the weekend, there was suggestions that um, one of the things that we're seeing is that the people being admitted to hospital are unvaccinated or a significant percentage are unvaccinated. And I just wondered whether we had data from York um, around the percentage of unvaccinated admissions we're having. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, and it and it's one that we um, ask quite a lot um, from colleagues in the NHS about whether we can get a vaccination status and also um, you know an understanding of are these people who who've got other comorbidities, for example, that mean they end up in in hospital um, needing to be managed. Uh, we don't get consistent data so we um, we sometimes get some anecdotal um, kind of reports back but we that data isn't um, routinely collected in a way that's you know able to be shared with us on a regular basis unfortunately. Thank you very much and I think James but you might your, your hand might have gone down uh, Mike still the same question. So. Sorry, you, you, your internet just went. Um, so Mike asked the same question that I was going to ask. So uh, I'm, I'm answered. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so um, with, with that, can't see any further questions. So we'll note the all the information that uh, Fiona has given. Thank you very much. Um, and we'll publish that that presentation after the meeting. Um, and I think Sharon, if if you could keep us up to date as best you can on the considerations around funding for 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 both testing and that trace service, I'm sure it's something that board members will want to to take up as it becomes hopefully clearer. Um, so that then takes us on um, to um, agenda item four. So that's vaccination and winter planning uh, programmes. I'm going to hand over to, to Steph to introduce it. Uh, the report was included um, in the pack. And then I'll also bring uh, Mike in um, after Steph. Uh, Steph. Yes, good evening, everyone. Um, you've had the report. The report is produced at a point in time, and that's on the data as we knew it on the 12th of November. So... As I go through the key highlights, I'll also update you on the latest information. And Mike has some um, information about uh, delivery activity from Ask and Boss. So um, we are starting to work with more and more pharmacies. Um, the local vaccination sites across the Vale of York and, and York specifically um, continue to deliver first and second doses, as you would imagine, in lower numbers as we move into uh, doing more work around the booster campaign. And I just wanted to highlight that the booster campaign has also recently uh, changed to include those aged over 40. And you can get your actual booster six months after your second dose, but you can actually book from five months. So it's just to help us with our, with our planning to make sure that um, we've got supply in the process. So please 
uh, do take up that booster dose when you're invited and when you when you're eligible. So um, just picking up on some of the activity. Um, so as we've talked about before, um, every time a new eligible cohort comes into our data, our percentage of those who've been vaccinated goes dip slightly. Um, so at the moment, we've got a total of 78% of residents in our clinical commissioning group patch of the Vale of York um, who are vaccinated with their first and second doses. And that's up from the, the figures that were in the report that was at 66 and 77% uh, are vaccinated with their booster also. They're, they're, they are good figures. Um, and when we look at that uh, in relation to the York wards, um, our coverage uh, for first and second doses is at 75%, so over 75% with 70% um, vaccinated with their booster doses as well for those who are eligible. So I think that that's um, a pleasing figure to see and the um, and might will come comment on um, just how popular the booster doses are. We are, we are seeing uh, clinics very, um, very popular indeed. So uh, particularly in relation to the conversation that we've just had about um, uh, positive COVID patients uh, in our hospitals, we've always been really focused in any first um, phase of the vaccines and, and the booster vaccine on our care home residents and our over 80s and as at the 23rd of, of November figures yesterday um, for our care homes across the Vale of York uh, we're reporting 97% uh, coverage of first and second doses and we're at 84% with the boosters. So again the, the, there is some variation in, in, in that but just to remind people that um, if you uh, have a, an infection, we would um, a COVID infection, or if you're feeling under the weather, particularly with 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 flu, we would we would wait four weeks before before giving the the, the vaccine. So, um, that that those figures are are good. Um, now, in the Vale of York, for our staff COVID vaccinations, those who work in care homes, um, we're, we've also been uh, very fortunate. Um, uh, we've worked together as a system and first and second doses are a, a very high 90% um, over 90s and the boosters are starting to, to move up. Um, we're currently at a, around uh, approaching 40% for the boosters and that reflects um, uh, the sort of uneven first and second doses related to um, take up first time round, just sort of referencing back that you become eligible for your booster at a period of time after your second dose. Um, so we continue to fo focus on that. I always reference vaccine supply and, and, and um, we, we're, we're approaching a year now. Our first vaccines in uh, the Vale of York were, were via, um, and particularly if we reference York, were via the Haxby Hub and and, um, and Ascombe Bar in that um, 21st of December phase. So we're, we're, we're close to a year delivering vaccines and um, it's become more complicated, not less complicated as more and more cohorts are at different scheduling events and also the, the, the different vaccine supplies uh, coming into the market and um, Mike may uh, make some comments on that as, as well. Um, and it'll also probably reference the school programme uh, because we heard Fiona talk about the um, where we're seeing our COVID um, infection rates and, um, and the age range, ranges. So we continue to work with practices and residents are in low take-up cohorts 
Um, we are going through another round of data quality review as well, um, just making sure that um, we've got the right data um, on GP records. Um, we use um, we use a national system, and sometimes there's 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 some um, uh, going to reference it as interface issues um, between the GP uh, systems and that reporting system. So um, every so often we ask our practices to to review, particularly those numbers who are showing as uh, not vaccinated. Um, uh, and we, we're currently doing a focus between 30, ages 30 and 49s as well. So that works ongoing and it just gives us an indication as to where we think about um, targeting access to services. And um, I just wanted to pick up uh, the additional uh, question that Fiona responded to when, when we heard about the uh, that university age range um, and who in the sort of non-university uh, groupings hadn't been vaccinated and that actually being lower take up. So I was pleased to see that Fiona was was seeing that there was no significant increase in, in the infection rates for that university age range now. As I understand it, and Fiona will correct me, um, that's a that's a reporting measurement related to that age, as opposed to only referencing those people who are in the university setting. So, um, I think that's something that Fiona and I will will take offline. And I, so I, I do want to understand if we could do something different around making the vaccination more co convenient for that for that age range. Um, so we do um, alternate and work our services to try and reflect uh, different different needs of those groups. So in the, the this last report, we've talked about the fact that we focused on on antenatal clinics, um, trying again to focus our, with our care professionals on a on a, a low take up group so we've done some additional work around around that so um we we do continually challenge ourselves um but you've heard me say and it's worth saying again that the that we don't want to harass our citizens um our evergreen offer our first and our second doses remain available um, and our practices are, are going through that process of contacting patients who haven't taken up a vaccine um, but uh, uh, we, we do just need to be mindful about engaging with with people on what is a voluntary vaccination process just want to um, make a final comment uh, about the uh, flu vaccine program um, and there's good take up um, many of our practices uh, in early weeks re, um, were reporting that all their vaccine stock had been used up because um, uh, the flu vaccination program was was um, taken up so so readily, and we're moving into the that next phase of resupply, and then um, going out and and uh, the national booking system prompts people. So um, I don't have any up to date more up to date figures than the than the twelfth of of November um, figures, which were indicating through general practice that. Um, we were in the order of 70% coverage for the over 65s. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll um, invite Mike to um, give a uh, Ask and Bar City perspective now. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Steph. So I can just give some um, updates on terms of just activity levels, really. So we're, we're having a, um, as Steph said, the boost um, levels are are really pleasing. There's been a very good uptake. People are obviously uh, very keen to have boosters. We've delivered 45,000 boosters at Ascom Bar now and now roughly delivering around 9,000 boosters a week. As Steph said, we're um, 
approaching our first anniversary and I'm confident by the time we get there, we've delivered half a million vaccines from the Ask and Bar site um, during that time. Um, we're putting extra clinics on um, to uh, vaccinate at the university, particularly focusing on international students, and the take up there is going well. And I've got to acknowledge Ian Wiggins and his team at the university who've been phenomenal in, in fitting those vaccination clinics. Um, just coming to our um, 12 to 15 year olds, um, we talked about this in previous meetings, and there was a, um, a, a slightly slow start. We've been supporting, we've been asked now as Nimbus Care to support the childhood immunization and vaccination teams. And I think um, since then we've made great progress. We de we've delivered six and a half thousand appointments from Ascom Bar for children in that age group. And we're now going into schools in the York area and have been doing that during November and delivered a further two and a half thousand vaccines, so 9,000 in total. And um, I think we're aiming to finish that school visiting program by the end of November. Um, a, a word on supply. Supply is good, partly because um, because of the um, support we've had at Ask and Bar, we were able to deliver all of the vaccines. And obviously we delivered Pfizer to begin with, then AstraZeneca, which is now reduced for reasons we're all aware of, but also Moderna. And, and we're one of the few sites now that deliver both Pfizer and Moderna. And because of that, um, we, 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 we get really good supply of vaccines. Um, so that's going to help us move forward with any demand we might have. Um, I'm going to just quickly touch on antenatal clinics. I think that's really showed partnership working in the city. We've been going into the hospital and delivering vaccinations in the antenatal, clin antenatal clinics um, at York Hospital. Really good take up. And I think that's really important. It's worth reiterating that 20% um, of the most critically ill patients nationally and currently are, are, are pregnant women who are often unvaccinated. So it's really important that we work with the hospital to deliver those vaccines. And finally, about flu, just in terms of activity levels, we've, we've um, worked very closely at Ask and Bar with all the practices um, to try and deliver flu and, you know, so take a little bit of pressure off day-to-day um, -day general practice, which um, is clearly under some pressure. Um, so we've delivered 10,000 flu vaccines at Ask and Bar, which is already more than we delivered there um, in, in in 2020 and we're continuing to do that and as new supply comes in um, um, we'll be continuing to deliver uh, the vaccines into the under 65 age group. Um, thanks Chair. Thank you very much Steph and, and Mike and I'll open it for any questions and comments. Go first to Sharon. Thank you for that, Steph and, and Mike. Really, really good news uh, about how well the vaccination programme is going. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you um, about an issue that has come up a number of occasions. I've had a number of residents contact me um, about this, and, and that's to um, help uh, kind of residents understand the difference between the third dose of vaccine if you have, um, uh, uh, if you're Im immunocompromised um, or have immune system issues, and then the third dose that is the booster, because a, a number of people are getting a bit confused uh, about this and are also confused about whether they'll be called by their GP if they're entitled to a third dose, if they're for clinical reasons, or whether they have to go to the national booking system. So um, it's probably a question for yourself, Mike, as to, um, to, to help residents understand the difference and what, what the kind of booking arrangements are for those. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. That's a really good question. So, if we, I think it's really helpful if we look at this and as in, in, in and use different language. So, a third dose is for patients who have issues with their immune system, whether they're on whether they have medical conditions that suppress their immune system, or whether they take medication that suppresses their immune system. And the third dose is um, so we have the first dose, then eight weeks, and then the second dose, and the third dose is eight weeks after that second dose. So it's a very different set of criteria. The rash being that the patient may not um, may not be able to um, raise an immune re response to the vaccine and therefore create antibodies that will protect them. So it's a it's a 
a, 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 an accelerated course of three doses to try and get their immune response up to where it should be. The booster is for people who have normal immune systems. And the idea there is after the two doses, at, over a period of time, your immune response will wane. And at the moment, the data suggests that that happens around the six month point, And that's why the 180 days between the second dose and the booster has been put in place. So I hope that helps to explain the difference in terms of how they should be called. Initially, the feeling was that it, it should be hospital specialists that initially initiate the third dose. But we've been working with them. Mark Quinn at the hospital has been working very closely with Nimbus Care. And then we're, we're, we're um, getting the information we need from practices and trying to contact those patients who should be eligible. They then can book in either through the local service or the national service. Both, both avenues are open to them. Um, and the only other point I would make about um, it's actually quite a, a, a slightly different um, group of patients, but it was referred to earlier, um, patients who've, who've had COVID infection, as you quite rightly said, um, Sharon, on the most part, they need to wait at least four weeks after that COVID positive infection to get a vaccine. Other than now, there's new guidance for under 18s. And, you, and you'll see that that period has been extended to 12 weeks. So if you're under 18 and you've had a COVID positive infection on a PCR test, that you now need to wait 12 weeks uh, before you have a second vaccine. And the reason for that is because um, there is a very, very small risk of inflammation of the heart muscle caused by the vaccine and the, and the senses that um, if we give it 12 weeks, that risk falls away completely. Thank you very much. Fiona. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, just on that last point, actually, Mike. So um, given that we know we've had such high rates in our school children, uh, so some of them won't have been able to take up the vaccine yet because they're still waiting for that 12 week period because they've had COVID. Can I just double check? So once the school program finishes at the end of November, will that uh, age group still be able to book on and go to Ascom Bar? Um, the short answer is yes. So we'll yeah. be we'll be running mop up clinics. And just to be clear, that's through the nationally commissioned service. So that that gives us a, a bit of a I wouldn't say an advantage, but it puts us in a really good position locally that that service is continued at the moment. It's commissioned right up until the end of March 2022. So we'll be um, continuing to offer sort of mop up clinics for our 12 to 15 year olds and under 18s, actually. Thank you. Yeah. Pete. Uh, thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, can I can I just ask, is it still the case that vaccination rates are lower in the more economically deprived parts of the city? Uh, and I've also got a question on the, the flu jab, actually. Um, do you have any idea how long the, the waiting time is for uh, booking a flu jab? And is there any fast track for uh, vulnerable residents? So in terms of low take-ups in the uh, in the areas that we've referenced before, that remains the case. Although uh, I haven't got the figures in front of me, so I'm going to say everybody is above 65%. But I'll I'll send the detail of of, of that um, data through. Um, and uh, flu vaccinations. Just just repeat repeat the question again. Is there just, anything? Just, they are well, free. No, I'm just wondering. Uh, yeah. I'm wondering if you know what what the the wait is for for booking one um, from when you book one to when you get one. Right. Okay. Uh, slightly is different. Any fast question. Track? So um, it it tends to go on the availability of um, the vaccines in the different areas. So each. Um, I'm, I'm going to call them contractor, but a, a practice or a pharmacy orders their own supply and delivers that activity. Now, the GPs in the city have um, uh, a, a collaborative approach with Ascom Bar. Um, and so they've been offering appointments to, to those people who are eligible and there's quite a significant cohort who are, who are eligible for, for free flu vaccinations. Um, and, and then we, we, we just roll out, out that programme. So it, 
it may be that we need to work with you to make sure uh, those groups who are eligible for free flu vaccines are aware that they are indeed eligible. I can see, I think, Mike, did you want to come well, in I, on that? I, just to add, I mean, you know, the, the, um, the, the first part of the flu programme is really prioritising those people who are vulnerable. So the elderly, those in care homes, those who are aged over 65 and with long term medical conditions. So um, we proactively contact people, councillor, and, and they're, they're given the opportunity to book. Um, wherever there's waiting problems, waiting list problems, it's, it's usually coming down to supply. So I know the community pharmacies got through the initial supply that they were allocated really, really quickly. Um, and, and without getting too steeped in the politics of this, last year there was a, um, um, you know, the pharmacies got got into they got they got um, run into a few problems um, with because they have to buy their vaccines, um, and they last year they bought a load of vaccines to vaccinate the under 64s and weren't able to use them because take up was really poor. So there's been a, some adjustment of ordering around that, um, but what we have ordered we're able to use really quickly. Um, the pharma companies. Um, ran into some difficulties earlier on in the season and the reordering and restocking of flu vaccines has proved a bit difficult. We're now into a phase where we can have access to that um, and those reorders have gone into the into the system. So we're waiting for delivery of new stock and if, and if there are any waits we'll be able to, as soon as we get receipt of that stock, we'll open up the appointments um, and our residents should be able to get their flu jabs. Can, can, so can I just ask Chair, do you know what the sort of average waiting time is? Um, I'm not sure, uh, Councillor, because there's so many different outlets that these vaccines are delivered through. Um, but I can certainly try and do some investigation on that and inform um, the committee of that um, in, in, uh, in the next week or so. Thank you. Um, Fiona, is, is yours on related or is it a new point? I just wanted to say in answer to that question about the wards where data, um, where vaccine uptake is lower. So in terms of the data that we have, the Guildhall, Fishergate and Hull Road wards um, have less than 65% uptake of two doses. And that's significantly less than other wards. Thank you very much. W one suggestion um, that we might want to look at is, is having the vaccination and winter planning report as a as a standard report um, moving forward and certainly for the next uh, couple of meetings um, which I think would be a, a really good idea um, and and hopefully we could bring uh, some of that information back on on flu vaccination and capacity and weights um, in in that January uh, report as well um, and one of the reports I found really useful was um, I think a joint report from Anita Stefan Mike that went through some of those vaccine inequalities and the work that you'd done and some of the the, the data and statistics we, we had on that and um, whether it's another opportunity to, to look again um, at that na next meeting and bring together all of that data if, if that is doable I think that would be good um, I can see some nods nods around the room so we'll, we'll pick that up in our work plan and when we get to the end as, as well. And um, I can't see any further hands up. So just to, to thank uh, Steph, Mike and, and everybody for, for that report and all of the work uh, behind it as well. Um, so that takes us um, straight through now um, to agenda item uh, five, which is update on the um, economy and building back fairer. Um, and James is gonna present this to us. Thank you, James. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll just start by uh, uh, passing on a thank to Simon Britton and the team at York Council who've uh, helped in pulling this together. So, uh, uh, you know, appreciate that. Um, I'll take the, the report as, as kind of read, but, uh, but also I'll highlight one or two few bits. So, uh, overall, e economically, it's actually a pretty positive um, picture. So, whilst the economy shrank by um, around 8.5% last year, um, current evidence indicates that it's actually going to get back to pre COVID levels and exceed it this year. So, so um, lots of the economic modelling didn't work last year because it's hard to, to, to model a, a pandemic, but the current intelligence that we're getting is that the economy has bounced back. Um, equally, whilst there has been a slight increase in employment, there's also a lot of businesses reporting vacancies. So we expect those to balance out. That, that there may initially be an initial spike in um, unemployment, given that we've now got the end of, of furlough. 
So again, that's still working its way out and we'll have to see what that is. But given the level of vacancies across a wide number of sectors, we do expect unemployment to get back down to pre-COVID levels and hopefully uh, below that um, pretty quickly in 21, 22 in, in the next year or so. So, so overall, um, the story on the economy is, is pretty strong. Um, linked to that, if you look at football, so if you look at the town centre and the impact on the, the town centre, um, football during the week is down slightly. Now, we would expect that because of the number of people working from home. So, so that is to be expected. But on a weekend, actually, football is, is above what it was um, pre-COVID. Um, and this kind of just demonstrates the tourism boom of, that we've had from staycations um, over the last year. Um, and one of the key challenges, how do we retain that going forward? So how do we keep York as the place where people want to visit and spend their money from that, from that perspective? Um, vacancy rates have been quite interesting in that York's actually generally been fairly resilient. Where, where we have significant vacancies, it has tend to be linked to the national chains that have failed. So the Arcadia Group is the ob obvious example uh, where you have shops such as Topman and Burton's, and they tend to be the larger stores. So if a larger store becomes empty with a national chain, it's harder for a local independent to fill it. And a uh, lot of the demand we're experiencing at the moment is actually coming from local independents from a, a retail perspective, but also we're now starting to get quite a, few, a bit of interest from a, a variety of different leisure options with regard to, which really kind of reflects the changing use of the, of the town centre going forwards. Um, if you look at how that kind of spreads out across York, obviously the standout one there is obviously Monk's Cross, but with John Lewis um, obviously closing up at Monk's Cross, that uh, slightly skews those figures. Um, so, so we're fairly confident about the town centre, given the level of interest that we've got. However, it does require a little bit of restructuring, um, follow the impact of some of the closures for, for some of the, mas the national chains. If you look at the wider economic and the kind of more macroeconomic risks that we've got to, to recovery, um, there's, a, there's a number of things that we need to take into account. Um, I've already um, referenced the, the kind of challenges in recruiting labour. Uh, clearly, this can have a drag on, a drag on growth if people can't get the staff that they need. Um, and it is actually starting to drive wage levels up as well. So um, you can see that as a positive or a negative, depending on which side of the equation you sit. But as we see to kind of get more better paid jobs, then that's potentially good. Um, quite a lot of manufacturing are, are reporting difficulties in recruitment and also supply chains. So you will, have, you will have heard kind of a lot on the news around global supply chains. Um, that is quite a, an issue and that's an ongoing issue. Um, um, it's not unique to York. There's nothing that York in particular can do to ease that. This is actually a global problem that it's, a, it's catching up on the back of it. But again, it could have some implication, particularly as we run up to Christmas and, and, and beyond from there. And equally, there's um, issues around inflation on the back of um, um, gas prices and, and kind of utilities. So um, the, the price of gas has, has effectively trebled. Um, and this is causing lots of problems with, with suppliers failing at a, a national level and actually at a, a, a business level, it's putting the cost up. So this is likely to lead to inflation um, on the, on the, on the, the, um, for customers and on the, sh on the shop floor. So we, we are expecting inflation to continue to grow. It's up at 4% at the moment, which is double what the national target is. Um, what normally happens when you get inflation of that level is that the Bank of England will increase interest rates to try and control it. At the moment, they aren't doing because the, the source of the inflation is the global energy crisis and actually increasing interest rates won't affect that, that because it's a, a global push. So, so whilst there may be some increase in interest rate rises in the future, at the moment they are holding steady, but we are, see we are seeing significant um, inflation. On the positive side, um, we're seeing a surge in the number of apprenticeships, uh, vacancies advertised. So from our young people's perspective as a valid route into employment, um, that's really positive to see. Um, like I say, we're seeing the demand um, um, in some of the key sectors and there are the jobs out there. So we, there are some real positives in there um, and we are also working to create new opportunities in and around York. So uh, uh, York continues to, to be a, a, a place where people want to live, one of the most desired places in the country. And as more people are able to work remotely, anecdotally, um, estate agents are saying that the, the level of interest from people in London and, and outside the region to locate in York um, and work remotely is increased because of the quality and the standard of living. Um, so there are some positive signs there with regard to the demand um, around what's going on. Um, York uh, Council, um, in, in, in partnership with um, the Archaeological Trust and the University of York, has secured over 600,000 from the Community Renewal Fund um, um, to invest, which will particularly add stimulus into the heritage assets within the city and the city centre, in and around Coney Street and, and beyond there. 
So that's a real positive going forwards. And we continue to work uh, um, with central government and other partners to a firstly try and attract a civil service hub into the, into the York. Um, but also, you you may have seen the announcement that um, Great British Rail are going to run a competition on where to host their new headquarters. Um, we are pushing hard for York to be the obvious place where we would like to see Great British Rail um, to be located and, and hosted. So, so there are a number of things that are happening at the moment where we're trying to create that stimulus and kind of really create the boost on the back of the toys and boom that we've had for the last year. Um, and, and working closely between the LEP and the council, we continue to support our businesses to do that. Um, importantly, we supported over three and a half businesses last year um, and, and looking forward, we're now developing both the, the 10 year um, um, city plan is, is well into development and also the LEP is working on a plan for growth across York and North Yorkshire, um, both of which are really trying to position the city to attract new investment into the future and make sure we invest in the right focused areas where we can add most value. But uh, happy to take any questions that anyone may have. Thank you very much, uh, James, and open that for questions and, and, and comments. And I believe it's the LEP uh, conference um, discussing that, pla that plan for growth. Uh, I'm sure you'd, you'd give it a plug, James. Well, th thank you for doing that. Yes, it's on Friday and uh, all are welcome. Thank you. Uh, Pete. Oh, th thanks, Chair. It's a quick question for James, but probably for, for Sharon as well. Do, do we see any um, conflict between encouraging increased footfall and controlling the spread of infection? Uh, what I would say is, uh, and, and this is it's, it's hard to get hard evidence on this, but but um, all the evidence is that when you go out into town, you see very few people wearing masks. It is the minority who are wearing a mask when whether you're in the supermarket or the the city centre. So so that is a, nat a natural conflict there that we see. But uh, certainly, all the evidence that we see is that uh, um, it, it's the minority that are wearing masks in in retail and, uh, and tends to be the. The, the older demographic, um, and I don't know, Sharon, you, you, you may be able to back that up, but that's certainly evidence that we're getting. Sharon? Yes, um, if I can respond to that point, please, Chair, and then I have a question um, as, as well for, for James. So, um, yes, it, it, is, uh, it, it is a challenge um, that we're constantly balancing as, as a city. You know, we, we need a good, strong economy. Um, we want visitors to the city because, you know, people visit York, they, they, they spend their money here. That's good for jobs um, uh, and uh, is, is important. Um, but on the other hand, uh, we're also mindful of the impact that can have on our infection rates. Um, and, and certainly, um, you know, on the map that, uh, the graph that Fiona showed earlier, you saw the massive spike in cases we had um, in kind of towards the end of December, uh, early January last year. So it is, it is a concern. Um, as I think we all know, the, the government has chosen not to mandate any COVID prevention measures. Um, so we're working hard with, um, with, 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 with businesses um, to try and encourage um, uh, COVID safe behaviours. And I know, Eddie, um, in your presentation, you'll talk about some of the work that we're doing with businesses and the campaign that, that, that we're doing. So it is, it is a challenge, um, ab absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's, it's one that we're constantly balancing. Um, my question really, James, um, and, and this might be a tricky one to answer, but um, I, I want to ask it nevertheless. Um, in terms of COVID recovery, we, we know that some people have been impacted um, hugely by the pandemic. Um, we know particularly that um, a, a significant number of residents have um, uh, suffered um, issues around their mental health. So existing mental health problems um, have been exacerbated and other people might be experiencing mental health issues for the, for the first time. So I suppose I'm, I'm interested to know what the LEP um, is, is, is doing and, and other partners that are working with the LEP to support businesses to widen the um, entry points into work. You know, what, what active support 
and are, are, are we giving to businesses to encourage them to open up those um, work opportunities for people who may have enduring mental health problems um, they they need to be in work because that's good for their mental health but at the same time businesses may need additional support to be able to um, uh, you know um, uh, employ those individuals in in their workforce but it's a key part of our recovery as a city and building back fairer as as, as a city so just wondering if you've got any kind of insights in, in into any of that or whether you feel this is a gap that that perhaps we need to be focusing on as 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 as, as the city recovers from covid i think i think it's a really really good question uh, sharon um well i think i think it actually goes broader than that so i think there is a mental health issue um within people who are still employed so there is the, the challenge about broadening the, the access routes into businesses, but there's also the need to support businesses as they are at the moment with their existing staff, because there will be a range of mental health issues that come out of the back of the pandemic and everything else that's happened alongside it, which we need to deal with to actually um, try and avoid more people falling out of work with, with kind of severe problems. So we've launched a mental health toolkit for businesses, which is more targeted at that side of things to try and help them protect and support their workforce so that it kind of stops making the situation any worse. Um, but actually, with regard to widening the, the, the kind of the routes into employment, there's actually an economic imperative. So if we look at the evidence around the number of businesses who are reporting vacancies that are difficult to fill, um, and, and th there are a lot of businesses out there, and it is a constraint on their growth. And, and one of the ways you've got to address that, so yeah, yes, you can pay higher wages if you're able, but actually you've got to make your employment accessible to a broader range of people in order to be able to fill those vacancies. So, so we're working with industry to do that. Um, and there are quite a lot of programmes out there which are um, funding the people who, who are perhaps furthest from the workforce to, to make them more employment ready. So I think that, that the point you make is absolutely right. We need to work with those individuals to help them so that they're in a fit state so that they, they are able to hold down a, a job. But we also need to work with the businesses to make them more um, kind of friendly and more adaptable and more flexible to sort some of these. So, so we have a number of programmes which are currently funded by what was EU funding. Um, and I think one of the risks is that the EU funding finishes in the next 12 months and we don't yet know what the, the follow on from that through the Shared Prosperity Fund is going to look like. So the vast majority of support for this type of issues is EU funded at the moment and there are some hugely successful programmes out there which are, are delivering and will continue to deliver. But picking up your point, the demand for it is, is only increasing and we don't know what's going to come next in, in 12 months time because it's not yet not yet been announced. So. We're expecting the government white paper, which is called the Leveling Up White Paper, to be launched in and around Christmas time, and hopefully that will set out um, what that can look like. But I think there is real value in us all working together now to design what the future programmes look like, because the historic programmes were, were designed for a pre-COVID um, world, and we've been tweaking them to make them fit, if you like, through the through the pandem pandemic and beyond. So I think it's a real issue. I think there's an economic as well as a health imperative to, to address it and work on it. Um, I think there's a real value in us working together to understand what the future looks like. If I could come back on that, please, Chair. Um, I, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with everything that, that you've said, James. And, you know, it, it, it seems to me that there is a risk there, uh, again, with the uncertainty around um, future funding. But, you know, we've demonstrated as a city throughout the pandemic that, that you know, we can work together to um, tackle these these issues. So I'm just wondering, Chair, whether the you know whether the board feels that that issue around um, mental health and and work is um, something that, as a board, we we might want to commission a piece of work around that and perhaps have a future report back um, uh, on 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 progress with 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 that. So. I've just uh, posed that 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 yeah. question to and, the board. and I'd, I'd be happy to take a lead on on that with regard to setting out what's got, what's happening at the moment because we work closely with the city of york council and, and with regard to the existing programs and then what we could do is we we could start then Sharon, and then come into you to kind of build on what we've already got so it becomes a, a joint report between the economy and the health side of things 
could I could see some nods as you were making that suggestion, Sharon, and thank you to, to James for that that way forward. And and um I know Sharon that the, the health sector um commissioned that piece of work around the mental health summit that, that was held. Uh, and uh, it would perhaps be good to to get a further update on on that and the work going on with health partners that, that could link into it. And um, Alison. All right, just to say I completely support that. So, I mean, as Sharon knows, we run Time to Change, which is about removing the stigma of mental health and trying to work with employers. Um, and I think we did a presentation last week or the week before with, with businesses, which I don't think was that well attended. So I think even though there's a willingness there, I think there needs to be more engagement, so more work to be done. Um, and certainly we can, we can participate with our Time to Change programme. Thank you very much. Um, so we're noting um, James's uh, report and all of that information, and obviously there's an action um, there that we'll, we'll take forward. So thank you very much to, to James and Simon's uh, team for, for putting that together. Um, that then takes us through to agenda item um, six, which is the communications update, and to formally welcome uh, Eddie. And I think this is your first presentation to this board. So welcome and over to you. Um, thank you very much, Chair. It is, it is my first, and, um, and hopefully I know... Um, enough about it to get through without um, without too much difficulty if you'll um, bear with me um, uh, many of the first few slides will be um, will be more familiar to members of the board than uh, they are to me um, uh, and uh, and certainly those things which I know have been reported to you over a long period of time now remain in place so the four phases of um, the approach the strategic approach to communications around um, outbreak management remain in place um, prevention responding uh, managing and and safe recovery and, and and indeed we've we've spoken in I think uh, part in, in in each of those um, phases as the uh, meeting has gone on. Um, the phased approach also um, remains in place and has previously been reported to you. So I don't intend to dwell on that, um, nor indeed the the, the baseline um, the mapping of the communications activities. Uh, where I think we do have um, new information which will be of interest. Um, to members of the board and, and should answer some of the questions which have already been raised this evening relate to um, the update of the current situation. Um, in first then, the, the work that we continue to do in terms of um, relationships uh, with the media and press releases, um, you will see that, that, that 30 of 80 uh, press releases still relate to COVID. So there is very much an emphasis, a large emphasis on COVID-19 in the work that we do directly with the media and, and a heavy emphasis there on, on the conversation we've just had around recovery and, and job support. Uh, perhaps by contrast, and, and I think this speaks a little bit to some of what will follow, we are seeing um, a reduction in the number of inquiries coming into us from the media. And, and I think it's perhaps not a surprise to anybody to hear that, that there is less media attention. And I think, I think a greater challenge to get the public to continue to think about COVID-19 and the work that we're doing in that space. Um, Secondly, of course, the thing is that we continue to make sure that we amplify the voices of public health professionals. And recently, of course, this work um, has put uh, has put Sharon um, on the telly, which is always nice. Um, and and we, we continue to make sure that those, that those, that those um, news opportunities are taken and that we keep COVID-19 in the public consciousness. And I think in this particular occasion, um, that was about, about urging, um, urging greater caution as we move into the winter months. And of course, um, a central plank of the strategy so far is making sure that we continue to share accurate and timely messaging with um, the residents of York. And as you can see, there are a, a number of examples of how we have continued to do that. Uh, the issue that's just been talked about, though, is perhaps the central focus of the work that we are doing at the moment. Um, and, and that comes to this idea of disruptive behavior change. It, it is clearly recognized, I think, that there is that, there is that, um, that tension between encouraging footfall um, and the rebuilding of York's economy um, and the risks that that brings, particularly, I think, from um, significant numbers of visitors to the Christmas market in the city center over the Christmas period. So what the team have done there is that they've looked at, um, you know, there's also a recognition that a lot of the, a lot of the national messaging is no longer really cutting through with, with, with the public and with residents. Um, so what we have started to look at there is, is, is the commencement of a disruptive uh, behaviour change approach, um, which, um, forgive me, 
um, which I, I know you're aware of, Chair, um, which, which means that we we are um, we're in the process of, of 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 working with businesses across the bid and across the city centre to physically put masks into the hands of people as they visit the Christmas market. We're working with Make It York, we're working with the bid. Um, and, and we have ordered um, thousands of masks which, um, which, which physically intervene. So rather than simply relying on people seeing the messaging, and this is a physical intervention, um, those uh, masks are, um, are with us now. Um, and and the, um, the supporting, uh, supporting publicity, which will be at points of access to the city and to the city centre, um, also shared with businesses, um, will be with us, uh, been ordered and are being printed and will be with us in the next couple of days for distribution. Key to that approach is the partnership with businesses themselves and, and businesses um, setting that example. You know, what Sharon, I think, will be very clear about is that the evidence is pretty clear. People increasingly carry masks in their pockets, but as they enter um, busy environments, particularly shops, they are um, they are less likely to put that mask on if the people in the shop are without masks. They are more likely to put that mask on if the people in the shop are already wearing them. And so breaking into that in a behaviour change space is, is the key focus of the work that we're doing between now and um, and well, the, 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 the new year, the new year shopping. Um, uh, we continue to um, act as a reliable source of information for people. And as we can see, that means that regular communications go out to um, email updates, to members and partners, the weekly resident e-newsletter, business newsletters, the families newsletters, the regular press releases that we've talked about, along with continued social media campaigns. And some of the work in terms of recovery that we're starting to see has included Facebook Live events around financial well-being um, with, with uh, uh, earlier this month with, with a reasonable reach and, and a significant number of views. And I think increasingly we need to look as we move into the recovery phase and the kind of conversation we've just talked about with mental health, about how we, how we um, target some of the communications around those recovery issues that residents will have. Um, as I say, um, there is this thing now about, um, about moving into that behaviour change place. Um, we continue to promote the regular use of testing um, and, and, and the good COVID behaviours, particularly among school aged children. Um, and we are, uh, we, we are continuing to use both um, City of York Council and national assets. One of my favourites since I've arrived, I have to say, is this whole idea of staying two archbishops apart. I think that's genius um, and it makes me smile every time I think of it. Um, and um, obviously, then the emphasis that we've again already talked about is that the work in, in, in supporting the vaccination of 12 to 15 year olds is, is going on, as is that distinguishing between colds and COVID, which was discussed at the beginning of this evening's meeting. Um, and as you can see, there's been some effort there. So again, shared um, social media assets on our channels, messaging designed to offer reassurance, letters that have gone to parents via schools. We have articles in both resident and the family newsletters. Um, we are sharing assets with the secondary schools and there is a deal of social media uh, and printed handouts. And as you can see from the bottom, um, some work with the media to reinforce all of that. In terms of vaccinations, again, we continue to respond to the demands of the programme uh, through the partner comms sharing work with NHS and CCG uh, colleagues, the business bulletin, the city employers, um, continue to promote vaccinations to the next phase groups as those come through online. And again, we've heard a lot about that this evening. And um, the, um, the weekly stats updates now include both the booster and the 12 to 15 um, vaccines. And clearly from what we've heard earlier, um, that is cutting through and particularly the take up of boosters, I think is, is, is very encouraging um, as a consequence of that lot. Um, perhaps really importantly, actually, and again, Sharon will recognise herself in this. Sorry, Sharon, but um, uh, the, the the council uh, internal comms has, has also demonstrated some leadership by example. Um, and you will have seen in local media, if you haven't been familiar with the internal comms, um, the lead that we have taken with our own staff in terms of infection control measures around making sure that we remind staff of the best possible practices they use our own offices spaces. Um, making sure that people are wearing masks when they're moving around the building, working from home wherever possible, making sure that they are sanitising um, and washing hands and so on and so forth. So some fairly clear um, internal leadership there as well. And we've started to talk about this already. So, so as we say, the, the recovery comms is now already starting to take some effect here around um, both physical and, and, as Sharon's already talked about, around mental health. So 
um, in terms of the What's My Next Step programme, we, we've already issued toolkits to partners to help them to support people to get more active. I think we're very conscious that, that you know, across the country, people have been very aware that, that, that lockdown and, and pandemic has, has done um, has done them no good in terms of their physical and, and mental well-being. And so we are now starting to look at how we can um, include the case studies and the articles and newsletters and internet, social media posts, and the three steps are about activity in the home, activity outdoors, where we've done some work with, um, with, with radio stations, and about persuading people to rejoin clubs and groups and become more socially um, active. And I suspect that has the dual benefit of being both um, both helpful in terms of physical health, but also in terms of that, that idea of kind of socialising and, and, and the mental health and support that comes from being part of those communities. And again, you can see there the work that's been done in the media to encourage that. Um, and then finally, the, the, the mental health work, the um, again, uh, toolkits uh, with articles for um, intranets and for newsletters, uh, aiming to encourage that honest and real conversation about mental fitness um, and promoting the helpful resources. And as you can see there, there are toolkits which include um, suicide prevention or bereavement, World Mental Health Day, and the wellbeing of students, um, York Business Week, and, and the, the challenging poverty and talking month. So you can see there's, there's a lot of activity. And as I should say, I, I think the intervention challenge just made is really helpful. And, and I suspect that we will see more and more. I mean, we need to do what we can to, to control um, outbreak and, and, and spread over these winter months and that period of, of people gathering together. But certainly as we move into the spring, I think the longer term objectives need to be around those kind of those those concerns that have grown through the through the pandemic around physical and mental health and the kind of support that people need in terms of, of skills and employment and and uh, and their finances. And we've seen some of that. So um, that's me done, Chair, and I'm uh, happy to take questions, although I can't promise at this early stage to be um, entirely able to answer all of them. Thank you very much for that and all that information. So I open it um, for any uh, questions, um, if we have have any. If not, again, to, to thank the, the teams and all the partners for all of their on, ongoing work, particularly on those new uh, campaigns. So thank you very much for that. Um, and that then um, takes us straight on to um, agenda item uh, seven, which is the update from the universities and higher education uh, subgroup. Uh, and Ian is going to take us uh, through this. Great. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, and again, uh, as with other presentations, I'll, I'll take as read the report that we put into the pack. And, and thanks to colleagues from uh, all the university and, and higher education FE colleges that fed into that. Um, a, a few kind of highlights uh, since then, um, just to bring everyone up to speed. Um, the first one to talk about is, is cases. And I think what's what's worth noting is the, the quite different picture that we've seen um, on campus at the university uh, and for York St John as well, compared to the rates in the city as a whole. So we, we continue to see really low levels of COVID cases amongst our student population. So to, to set that in context, um, this time last year, our, our busiest week for cases was week three of term, um, where at the University of York, we had 390, just under 390 cases in a week. But that same week, this time around, we had just 24. Um, and we're currently at about 10 active cases uh, at the university amongst our, our student population. So, so really low levels of, of cases. And we're putting that down to a, a number of things. Um, vaccination clearly um, is, we think, the, the biggest driver of that. Um, but, but we're also seeing good behaviours across kind of the student population and um, pretty good mask use still, although as, as we're seeing in town, that, that's always a challenge. And I'd echo the comments and from Eddie's uh, presentation about once you're physically putting the masks into the hands of individuals and modelling that behaviour. So we're seeing for lecturers when they ask students to start wearing a mask and where they're wear wearing them themselves, that then has an impact on, on mask use. Um, and testing has been a real uh, supporter of, of those low levels of cases. So um, our survey data suggests that about three quarters of our students are testing at least once a week. Um, as Fiona's presentation at the start of the uh, the meeting, we're not seeing that come through into the NHS dashboards. Not many of them are then reporting that that kind of results. Um, but given the number of tests we're pushing out into student accommodation, we know that they're being used and we've got that survey data to back it up. And we're seeing that in students who are testing positive, that it's quite often the, the lateral flow test that has um, let them know that they're that they're positive and triggered that isolation. So we're, we're in a, a, a good position on cases, but across all of the institutions, we're continuing to stay um, very um, uh, very cautious and, and keeping a very close eye on what cases are, are doing. 
Um, vaccinations uh, continue to go well, um, and uh, Mike mentioned it earlier, uh, to thank my team, I'll, I'll return that uh, in spades to the Nimbus Care team and other city partners we've been working with. Um, I think it's a, a really good news story. Um, we continue to see really high vaccine uptake across our students as to the other institutions in the city. Um, and in fact, we, we've been asked by the Department for Education a couple of times now to speak to other university groups about what we've done to increase um, vaccine uptake um, as some sort of best practice for others in the sector to, to model. So a really good news story there. And we continue to see high rates. And um, the, the biggest group of focus, as, as Mike mentioned in his presentation, is, is those international students. Um, quite quite a lot of our, our domestic students are arriving already partially vaccinated and um, international students particularly coming from countries that haven't had as um, advanced a vaccine program they're our real target audience and where we're we're focusing so we had a really good series of pop-up clinics during freshers week um, we had another one a few weeks ago and we've got one coming up this saturday and um, to really just make that as available as possible for students um, throughout the the term um, and who knows what will happen with boosters for uh, for younger age groups and we, we may be looking at, at boosters for um our cohorts as well but we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it um, and then i think the the, the final uh, point to to update on uh, is now just we're starting to think about the end of term um, so for those of our students who aren't staying in York, um, we'll be uh, doing a, a number of things, uh, making sure that they're um, fully stocked in test kits before they head home. So they've got those to carry on using through the, the Christmas holidays, reinforcing that advice about regular use of LFDs and noting that the change in language that government's using as of yesterday, that they're encouraging a, a lateral flow before any kind of social engagement uh, at all, really, uh, and really stressing that for our students over the, the festive period. Um, we haven't yet had any guidance from the Department for Education about the end of term. We're not expecting there to be a student travel window like there was this time last year. It would be very odd if there was because there are no national restrictions to travel. So it would be odd to single out students as a particular group for that, although it wouldn't be the first time that's happened over the course of the pandemic. Um, but we're not expecting any particular um, guidance, but we'll be encouraging all students to take a test before they travel. Um, and then uh, also to take a test um, before they come back uh, to York from wherever they are. Um, and it's that movement that I'm particularly focused on. So we've got quite low case rates on campus. I'm not overly concerned about the movement from York to wherever students might be spending the holidays, but particularly for those students who are heading back, there might be younger um, children in the household, they might be in an area of higher COVID prevalence, that then return journey, it is a point I think of, of higher risk that we need to focus on. So just really encouraging um, students to take some lateral flow tests with them and to use those before they get back on the train and head back to York from wherever they've been over Christmas. So we'll be reinforcing that in our communications as, as well. Um, and I think that's it for, for, our, for our update. The only other point I'd make on cases, um, we uh, continue to not see any evidence of transmission um, in teaching and learning environments um, in terms of the case data that, that we've seen. Um, we do have a number of staff cases. Um, we've seen that throughout the pandemic, as you'd expect, um, but we continue to see that now. Our analysis of what's driving that is it tends to be those staff that have got school age kids. So it's that transmission from um, uh, kids getting it in a school environment and then bringing it back into the household rather than anything in, in the university or, or work environment that, that's been driving those infections. But that, that's, you, know, you can never entirely pin down on what that's happening, but it certainly seems to be a trend where we've got staff with, with school age kids. Thank you very much, Ian. So I'll open that for any um, questions or comments if, if colleagues uh, have any. But again, like the last item, just to, to thank you and all the, the teams at the various uh, colleges, universities and, and equally through to schools um, for all of that uh, work. Um, so that then um, takes us on to um, agenda item eight. So this is just items um, for the next agenda. So we've got those standard items that we have so the current situation um, in York, the communications update, the universities and higher education update and we talked earlier um, and I'll make sure that a further update um, about uh, vaccinations uh, and winter planning is is added to the, the January, January uh, meeting and equally in the future a review of the outbreak management board terms of reference will, will come for information um, to the board and um, and then if, if Sharon and Fiona could perhaps with James pick up a a conversation about uh, mental health and when and when that piece of work could come back and um, and then with uh, Tracy 
um, we equally um, talked about uh, vaccine inequalities, whether that could be included in the vaccine update or could be a future report in the in in, in the future. And um, if there are any other items um, now or as you uh, think over Christmas, please do just get in touch and, and we'll add that to the next uh, board uh, meeting. Um, then uh, the final item uh, today is the agenda um, for the dates of future meetings. And I'm just checking our next meeting is the 26th of uh, January uh, next year. So I'm, I'm not quite getting to the point of wishing people happy uh, Christmas, um, but nonetheless, approaching, approaching that point. Um, and then item 10 is any other business. I've not been told of any. I'll just check uh, around that nobody is now frantically waving at me that they've got an extra item. So just again, to thank you all for those reports, all of that work that continues uh, to go on and for attending the meeting today. Uh, and I'll see you again in January, if not before. Thank you all. Bye bye.